get started. Uh, welcome to all of you. My name is Penny Wright. I'm in charge of adult programs here at the library, and we're delighted to have you all, and we're delighted to have today's guest, David Bouchier. And I'll just mention a couple of things before we begin. Um, we have a newsletter. Some of you may live outside of our library district, and if you do, take a newsletter. If you would like to know about things that are happening here at the library, become a friend of the library for whatever amount you want to give, and you will get our newsletter in the mail every two months. So that's great. We have a lot going on, and we'd love to have you here for it. Um, this morning, I searched my computer to see when the last visit from David Bouchier was. To my horror, I realized it was in 2007. Wow. <laughs> it's so terrible. This is actually his fourth visit here, and I must have had a memory lapse because it wasn't until I read his most recent book that I was reminded again uh, that we are missing his clever commentary, which I, as you probably know, can be heard on WSHU every Monday between about quarter of eight and quarter of nine, so, or somewhere around there, right, David? Is it? Actually, this morning, I learned how to go on WSHU's <coughs> website and scroll down to David's picture, and then you could listen to all of his essays, which I hadn't known. That's a, it's a really great thing. But, uh, I also asked him if next year he would come back and read a selection of these wonderful essays, and he said yes, so we will be seeing more of him. I'll tell you a few uh, things about David Bouchier. In his words, he was born in London just too late to join the Second World War. He worked initially as a journalist and a bookseller in London, as well as, as a tour guide in Greece and Turkey. Rather late in life, he received a PhD from the London School of Economics and spent two decades teaching at what one of Britain's new universities. A faculty exchange program in 1979 brought him to Stony Brook, where he met and later married Diane Bartha, a professor at the university. In 1986, he moved permanently to the US and taught for a number of years at Stony Brook and at Suffolk County Community College in Riverhead. Apart from teaching, David has pursued a minimal. Very well. Can you tell the difference? I didn't do anything. Okay, we'll do it again here. Um, he has pursued a lifetime interest in writing. His commentaries and opinion columns have, have appeared in dozens of newspapers, and he has contributed fiction and nonfiction to literary and political magazines. His humor column, titled Out of Order, appeared in the national regional Sunday edition of the New York Times for 10 years. His Monday essays have been running since 1992 on WSHU. And he can still be heard yeah, so sorry. every week during morning edition. He was also oh, sorry. he was also the host. He is also the host of a podcast titled "A Few Well Chosen Words." Until 2015, David hosted a program of classical music, which we miss, and commentary called Sunday Matinee on WSHU learning a great deal about music in the process. His most, two most recent books are a collection of stories about life in a French village called Not Quite a Stranger and Out of Thin Air, a new memoir, An Unexpected Life, which was published by Permanent Press, uh, came out in 2018. By the way, two of David's books, but not the most recent book, are for sale at the uh, table over there. One is $10 and one is $5. <laughs> so I already bought mine. Um, David and Di Diane al um, alternate their time between Stony Brook and a village in France. Please welcome David Bouchier. I guess that's 
I guess that'll work. I'm sorry. Okay, good. Oh, is it working now? Okay. You'll get maybe an essay out of this. There's always a technical problem. Does this work? This works. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, well, thanks so much, everyone, for coming out. I hope you all got your brown bag lunches. I see that's what it is described as today. Little, maybe little delicate French treats and half a bottle of wine and the French idea of a brown bag lunch. Um, okay. Uh, I've always had a sort of tenuous connection with France. Uh, just the name tells you essentially that it's, uh, you know, it's a French name, a French family. Originally, the name Boucher is just a corruption of uh, butcher in French. Uh, and it's true that there never has been a vegetarian in the family. Uh, and uh, people love to, to look for their roots these days, although it's often a big mistake. Uh, and I, I found, as far as I can find anything, that my roots are about 50% in France. Um, and uh, my family migrated from there, at least according to the family legend, about 1804, which was the year that uh, Napoleon declared himself emperor. So that was about the last sensible thing my family ever did. Uh, they arrived in England when millions of people were leaving Europe and coming to the United States, but my family typically got stuck, um, and they didn't get any further than the east coast of England and stayed there. Um, and over time, of course, they became very English. This happens to immigrants everywhere. They became more English than the English and came to despise everything European everything foreign, indeed. Uh, so we never traveled abroad. We never went to France when I was a child. Uh, we never went to Spain or any of the other regular European holiday destinations. And you know how it is when uh, a child is forbidden something, it becomes the most interesting thing in their whole world. Uh, that's what they want to do. So I really, really wanted to get to France. And uh, the first time I got there was, uh, I guess it must have been, Oh Lord, uh, 1955 or so, um, and uh, I was I just got my first license in a little motorcycle, disgusting old motorcycle, uh, and I took it over to France on the boat, and I was just enchanted. The weather was terrible. Uh, France was still in a kind of miserable state after the Second World War, but everything was so interesting as it is when you travel seriously for the first time. The food was different, people were driving on the wrong side of the road, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the um, everything, everything was, was different, exciting and strange. And that sort of stuck with me, you know how it is, the first experience of anything is usually the most memorable experience, and that one, brief though it was, uh, just stuck in my mind in, in tremendous detail. I traveled down to Paris, uh, spent a bit of time in Paris, and then rode back again on my dilapidated motorcycle and pretty much went back to France every year after that for one reason or excuse or another. There's a saying by Benjamin Franklin that you've probably heard that every man has two countries, his own and France. <laughs> um, he was uh, very uh, much attached to the country, as was Thomas Jefferson, of course, who was an ambassador there. And, uh, of course, you have to remember that um, up to about 1803, almost half of American territory was French um, and was sold back for mysterious reasons. So just think what a different country it would be if that had never happened. You'd probably have a very different diet driving much, much faster than you do now, and generally would have a very rich culture. However, the uh, Battle of Yorktown, plus a few other things, finished all that. So France has become a sort of a, a place of magic and mystery for a lot of people, especially uh, Paris, all those medieval kings and battles, the tremendously long history of the country, 
And um, I think for, for um, people in this country, it's still seen as a center of fashion, center of glamour. And uh, let me see if we can move this along a little bit. Here's enough forms. We'll come back to that in a second. And uh, the City of Lights. Uh, all of those histories from the 1920s of uh, Ernest Hemingway and Gertrude Stein and F. Scott Fitzgerald and the musicians gathering together in Paris and forming a sort of incredible <coughs> cultural coterie and current cultural world. Um, about one and a half million Americans go to Paris every year. And there are, in this little book, uh, maybe six or eight essays about living in Paris, which I've done from, from time to time, about the wonders of riding one of their free bicycles, about uh, food, about all sorts of things. But what it's mainly about um, is about the, uh, the rest of France, because Paris obviously isn't France any more than New York is the United States of America. Paris is a very particular sort of place. And so let's go south straight away and look at this area. I don't know how clear this map is to you, but this is the uh, general area called Provence and Languedoc-Roussillon, although the French have changed the name of Languedoc-Roussillon, so it's now Occitanie, which nobody loves, um, but which corresponds to the language that used to be spoken down there, Occitan, which is a weird mixture of uh, Latin and uh, Spanish, as far as I can find out. Um, it's still alive. People still speak it. Uh, people speak with an Occitan accent in that region. And every night on the, on the national news, there's a segment in that language, which I can't understand a single solitary word. Some of our neighbors spoke that language. OK, so we're going south. And I put this picture of Cyprus in because traveling down from Paris somewhere on the train. Uh, this is, to me, is always the sign that you've arrived. You begin to see mountains, you, you see no more great expanses of flat field, no more factories, and you see hills, mountains, and you see cypresses. So here we are, it's the south. And the south of France has the same sort of glamour to it as Paris does, um, but it has a number of different meanings for different people. For the French, who confusingly call it all the midi, uh, which makes you think it should be the middle of France, but it's not. Um, pretty much everything south of Toulouse is the midi. Um, it's a very confusing sort of place. Uh, people, some people see the south of France just as the Mediterranean coast, the Côte d'Azur, with all of those casinos and celebrities and filmmakers and all the rest of it. Um, others associate it with Provence very much. Um, this, I think, is, is all the fault of Peter Mayer. Uh, I know he lives around here, I hope he's not here. Um, <laughs> but Peter Mayer, who in 1989 wrote that uh, great best-selling book, A Year in Provence which was followed by a whole bunch of other books by him and by other people on the same sort of theme, you know, a year in, a year in Florence or a year in Capital, you know, and all this sort of thing. And uh, uh, it became a positive industry, uh, literary industry. People took uh, a year in Provence to mean that you could travel down to the Rhone there and uh, set yourself into a beautiful village full of interesting characters um, and uh, live, live a sort of ideal life. And many, many, many people followed people, Peter Mayo down there and attempted their own year in Provence one way or another. Um, I suppose we, sh we probably fell into that category because my wife and I are both been very fond of France. She spoke much better French than I did. She'd studied in Paris. And so we often went down there uh, on vacation. And uh, one year, we were offered the chance of, it was a sabbatical year, uh, we were offered a chance of renting a place in a village for the whole year. Very, very cheap. Cheap was very attractive. Um, we made the huge mistake of not looking at the village first. Um, 
But we arrived, we turned up in this place. Uh, it's called Anyang, and you can see the hills rising in the background there, uh, showing that it, it is in a, in a steep valley, mostly a wine-growing valley, in the region called the Erol, which is uh, more uh, westerly, uh, sorry, it's westerly towards uh, Spain. Let me get my little pointer here going. Here's Montpellier. Uh, so it's a little bit, a little bit north of Montpellier. Um, and uh, Spain, Spanish border is, is, is down here. Carcassonne. That's the region of the Languedoc. Uh, this village was uh, a little bit rough around the edges, let's say. That's the street we lived in. Uh, it doesn't look too terribly uh, exotic. It doesn't look at least a bit like anything in Peter Mail. Um, and uh, it was just about seven or eight feet wide. We made the experiment of putting the car in there just once. Um, but it got all the neighbors, all the neighbors working together to get it back out again. Uh, so that's how we met all our neighbors, in fact. Um, they built their houses upwards, um, really uh, for security reasons. This village was founded in, in the year 777, according to the legend, by a wandering monk. And it really hadn't been much improved <laughs> since. Uh, it had about 2,000 inhabitants, no parking space whatsoever. And uh, nevertheless, it was, it was an interesting place to spend a year when that wasn't what you were expecting. It wasn't what we were expecting. We were expecting something much more picturesque. We were expecting a kind of Olympic climb to get to the top of the house. But that's what we had. They were afraid of Saracens, I think. Now they're afraid of tourists. <laughs> and uh, so we stayed there for a year and enjoyed uh, the, the business of getting to know people. And the fact that this was a village dedicated to two things. And all villages seem to have a, a sort of identity uh, in France. Uh, not so much I find in, in, in England or other countries, but in France definitely. This was two things, politics and wine. Wine is understandable because the whole area is, is vineyard. But politics, it was a very passionate political village. And uh, the politics mostly centered around the mayor's office because the mayors in France are very powerful and uh, have a lot of sway over how people, ordinary people live and what can be built and everything of that sort, which uh, here would be uh, a much larger scale. Uh, authority and the mayor was was a socialist and uh, was uh, out of out of favor with the villagers at the time we were there so that they right with where they threw him out and put in a communist who was much more to their taste um, so it was basically a communist village in terms of its politics um, although it didn't make any difference really to, to the way people lived and uh, we, we we survived our year there. Um, there's a little book called The Cats and the Water Bottles, uh, which is copies over there, which tells of some of the games that the villagers played on us and some of the bizarre legends that they told us, which turned out to be totally untrue. Uh, but on the whole, it was, it was a good year, uh, but not exactly a stellar year. So, when we came back, we said, okay, we must do that again, but not there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was the basic lesson. We searched year by year, we looked at different villages, and uh, you might say, why villages? Um, it's purely personal. Could have been Paris, it could have been anywhere, uh, if we wanted to live in France. But I just happen to like villages very much. It's a very old-fashioned, uh, taste, I know it's like a taste for steam engines or something like that, but I love a place where you can, you can basically know most of the people who are around you, rather than having 10 million of them out there that you don't know at all. Um, I love a place where you can walk for 5 or 10 minutes and be in the countryside, the real countryside. 
And I love a place where there are no strip malls or tower blocks. Um, that's a village, you know, whichever way you cut it. And it may not have all of the amenities of the town, but it has different amenities. For example, people always say, well, you know, live in the city, we've got all these wonderful galleries, we've got all these wonderful theatres, we've got these concerts. Well, you know, a village has the same thing. A lively village has the same thing on a smaller scale. Instead of galleries, it has real artists. Instead of theatre, well, the village itself is usually a kind of theatre anyway. Um, and uh, concerts are a sort of constant feature. Almost all villages I've been in in France for any period of time, they've had concerts, not necessarily big spectacular concerts, but chamber concerts, you know, all sorts of things, world music, whatever. So you get the same things, but on a smaller scale, which is fine by me. Uh, some people think in a village you have no privacy, but you know, once you close your door, you have as, exactly as much privacy as you do in Manhattan. It's, uh, it's just a matter of what you choose to share with people. It's true they're going to, they're going to be curious about you, but uh, that doesn't mean you have to tell them anything. <laughs> and I suppose some people, uh, there's a degree of trust, uh, and some people do feel a little afraid of villages because they've been watching Midsummer Murders and Miss, <laughs> Miss Marple and, and they think that every every village has a murder every week. Well, not in my experience. <laughs> Only one village I've ever lived in, and that was an English one, had a murder, and everybody knew who did it, so there was no reason. <laughs> um, so we were looking for a village, and we looked in the in the area for Languedoc. The real difference between Languedoc and Provence is, is well, from the foreigner's point of view, it's economic. If you're traveling through Provence and you're traveling through a landscape of expensive restaurants and fine hotels, beautiful landscapes and antique stores, uh, you cross over into longer dark and the hotels sort of become much more modest, the restaurants also, and the antique stores turn into junk shops, <laughs> selling the same things, of course. But, uh, well, that was a little book that we wrote about uh, life in the first village and the end, cats and the water bottles. Um, that was how people hung out there, laundry across the street as you see it, because almost nobody had a dryer. Um, but for the young widows of the village it was a useful advertising uh, possibility. <laughs> uh, Languedoc is, is at least as beautiful as Provence. All of it looks like this of course. Um, I'll just show you one or two just snapshots from around the country. There are many, many, many of these beautiful old stone houses, most of them farmhouses, scattered across the landscape. Um, there are many of these rather curious little uh, dry stone huts, which actually are shepherd's huts, called Capitel. Um, and they're all over the place too. I have never actually seen a shepherd go into one, but maybe they do. And, um, you know, lots of, lots of, landscapes like this. What we're looking for is this, right? The ideal French village and the village of the fantasy um, with the flowers and the shutters and uh, uh, just the charming little characteristics. Picture postcard in other words and that's actually exactly what this is, a picture postcard. Um, we found a good, uh, a close approximation um, and here we go a little bit westwards, uh, I can't quite see where we are, Avignon, here we are, Nîmes. Um, around the area of Nîmes. It's convenient to have a big city close by, for practical reasons. And the village that we wandered into one day, literally wandered into, uh, was called saint quentin la Fauterie, uh, which tells you something about it right away. So we found this place, of course it wasn't lost, um, and we found it uh, by chance when we were looking for a place to rent, looking at various rentals advertised in the newspapers. And we found a very sweet little house in the middle of the village for rent. Um, and when we inquired about it, the owner said, yeah, um, you can have it, but also it's for sale if you'd like to buy it. 
And this was just about the time when Obama was going around saying, yes, we can. <laughs> uh, we all got this sense of you know, unrealistic possibilities. Um, so we did buy it. Uh, it, was, it was a very cheap price, small house. We thought, why not, instead of paying rent in one place after another. And it was right bang on the main street, uh, which is called Grand Rue. Uh, and that's, like, that's actually the house there with the blue door. Uh, very small, as you see, stone house, uh, dating from about 17, 17, I don't know, 1710 or something like that, who knows. Um, and, uh, of course, we never actually owned a house that old before, and that was a revelation uh, in itself. It, it had been renovated. You can see the stonework is in pretty good shape. Um, but there were various uh, visitors in there. Uh, and uh, there was just the whole business of uh, living with that kind of history. Yeah. Let me just read you one of the essays out of this book, if I may. When in France we inhabit a small village house, the word inhabit is appropriate because these old stone houses have something of the feeling of cave dwellings, even if they're equipped with every modern convenience. The village has been here for more than 600 years, first written about in 1152, by which it was already well established. The basic layout of the streets has not changed much from the maps made in the 1600s, and the nearby town of Uzez has been home to the Dukes of France for over a thousand years. So naturally, we were interested in the history of this place, who lived here, and what their lives were like. But it was hard to get any reliable information. Village houses were built for peasants and artisans, and don't appear in any written record. They've been built on, built over, and renovated for hundreds of years, so there's no overall architectural style such as you might see in a church or a grand chateau. We have to rely on the clues we can get from the older parts of the building itself and on the stories told by our neighbors and by our handyman, Pascal. These stories are notoriously unreliable. There's something about the history of houses that makes even normally honest people lose their moral bearings. <laughs> a house, especially an old one, is a subject for romance so the tales we hear have to be taken with a very large pinch of salt. We can be sure of one thing, our house is seriously old. The popular public television show, This Old House, claims to be about renovating antique structures, but their Brooklyn brownstones and Bostonian arts and crafts homes are brand new construction compared to our old house. Villagers built these places to last using large chunks of granite and because they're right in the middle of the village, the house is supported on both sides by other equally solid and ancient structures. Based on the stone vaulting in the lowest part of the house, we guess that it was built sometime in the 1700s. Animals were kept down there, and you can still see the stone drinking trough with iron rings to tether the sheep or goats. Career opportunities were limited. The inhabitants may have worked in the vineyards or the olive groves and supplemented their incomes with milk, cheese and wool from these animals. Also from the 19th century on, the village had a small industry of pipe making, which led to its present reputation as a centre for ceramic art. So this old house has seen a lot of history. Eight kings, the French Revolution, two emperors, two world wars, five republics so far. When it was first built, Louis XIV, the Sun King, was living in splendor in his palace at Versailles, oblivious to the revolution that would sweep his royal descendants away. And in Paris, intellectuals like Voltaire were fomenting the political revolution called the Enlightenment, the philosophical revolution, I should say, called the Enlightenment. But out in the country, life in villages like this must have been brutally hard with hot summers, cold winters, backbreaking work, and not much in the way of entertainment apart from the occasional religious war. At first, the house seemed semi-sacred just because of all that <coughs> heavy history. I even hesitated to drill a hole to hang a picture, but I needn't have worried. 
the electric trill just bounced right off the granite, <laughs> and I had to hang the picture somewhere else. These old houses survive for a reason. They don't yield to storms, floods, earthquakes, or temporary occupants with electric drills. They're there for the duration, whatever that duration may be. And uh, so I hope you slowly come to terms with a place like that, you know, with its history, what you can do, what you can't do. And anybody who's lived in an old house knows this. <clears throat> we did have a, a, a sort of perennial handyman called Pascal, um, and what he had in common with the great philosopher was that he thought a lot. <laughs> um, he, he thought a lot more than he worked, but um, he did do some amazing plumbing and electrical jobs for us, which left the house you know, full of strange pipes going this way and that way, and, and electric wires coming out of walls, and this sort of thing. Make it more interesting than a typical house built to the <laughs> local uh, rules here. Um, one of the most striking things uh, about living in Europe is, is the constant presence of history, older civilizations. Um, they give us a time perspective, I think. And it's good to have a time perspective to make us, as it were, reduce our self-esteem a little bit. Um, Paris has that effect on me in general, not so much because of the history, but just because of the, the intellectuals of Paris and the bookstores of Paris. You just go into a Parisian bookstore and you immediately feel like an idiot. You know, you know, it's not that you don't understand everything, but you know it's, it's such a there's such a weight of intellectual work, intellectual labour there. Anyway, but um, history has the same general effect, um, and uh, it just reminds us we're one civilization among many that we just arrived five minutes ago. We'll probably be gone in another five minutes, and the whole thing is just you know moving along, moving along, moving along. And if you live in uh, one of the old civilizations like France, you can go see <coughs> caves of La Salle, for example. We can see art from 17,000 years ago. Um, you can go to a Gothic cathedral built in the 12th century, listen to music from the 9th or 10th century, um, palaces of Versailles, um, you know, it puts you in your place, historically speaking, to be aware of all that history. Uh, in the local town, four kilometers away, called Uzez, uh, there's this ducal palace that I just mentioned, uh, more or less. Uh, goes well, not not the whole palace, but parts of it go back a thousand years, and the Dukes of France have been established there for about a thousand years, and the uh, Duke is still there, Duke of Saxe, and for a <clears throat> not at all modest fee, will actually take you on a tour around the castle personally. <laughs> um, so there's that kind of history, and who says it's a very pretty medieval town with a with a very striking medieval centre where they hold uh, historic festivals from time to time. In the country, close by, um, there's another trace of history uh, from the Romans. This is a walk that we like to take in the Valley de Leur, um, which is right near Uzez. A beautiful stream, big park, playgrounds, and this sort of thing. It's a beautiful walk. And if you walk along through that valley, you see some odd things um, out of the past, like this, for example, uh, buried in the ground but dug out so that people can see it. Um, and this is the remains of um, an ancient Roman aqueduct. Uh, the Romans inhabited this area um, about 200 BC and stayed there for about uh, 500 years. Uh, and so the Romans needed water, obviously. A place like the valley that I just showed you was an absolute gift to them. But they didn't particularly want the water there. Um, they wanted it 30 miles away in their big city, which was Nîmes. If you've ever been to Nîmes, you've seen the Roman ruins and the big Roman Colosseum and all, all of that. It was a big Roman center. Um, what use is it 30 miles away? across a rough landscape of hills. Well, they built an aqueduct. 
And you have to think about it for a moment. You know, here they are, they've got no mechanical aids, they've got no computers, they've got no uh, computerized surveying equipment, um, no pumps to move the water along, nothing like that. Um, and uh, yet they managed to move the water from the Valley of the Yale, um 30 miles to Nîmes, in which distance it descends exactly 31 feet just enough to keep it running without pumps. It's an extraordinary feat of engineering. Absolutely extraordinary. It's one of many. There's just, just one I have to be very familiar with. And the most impressive part of the whole structure is this very famous uh, site, which is the uh, Pont du Gard. Still in pretty good shape from the first century AD. That carried it over the last valley um, into Nîmes. And that's a World Heritage tourist site, and all the tour buses go there. Um, but uh, if you ignore the tour buses, it's a, it's an extraordinary, extraordinary piece of history. Uh, they do some Lumia performances at night. They do historical performances, that kind of thing. Okay, so um, that's infrastructure for you. That's, that's building infrastructure. And when the Romans built it, they really built it to last on 50 years. They built it last for 500 years. And you wonder to yourself, well, what kind of leaders does it take to sustain a natural building of the aqueduct for about 40 years? Um, what kind of leaders does it take to sustain that kind of infrastructural commitment? Because for the Romans, that was to claim the territory. You know, to claim the territory was to build on it. Well, the two most prominent Roman emperors during the building of the aqueduct were Caligula, who was a madman, and Nero, who was a tyrant. So clearly for infrastructure, you need someone with a strong personality of some kind. The whole region is saturated in history. Uh, the village we moved into um, is uh, dedicated to pottery. Uh, that's because of its old history as a maker of a pipe making centre. Uh, and because the clay is there, of course, you know, if you're going to have pottery village, you need clay. And walking in the woods and in the vineyards, you can just literally scrape the surface with your foot and find this beautiful red clay just underneath it. It's just exactly perfect for pottery. So about 20 years ago, the mayor of the village, who was then a woman, uh, say, well, this village is dying on its feet. We've got to find something to bring people in. Uh, why don't we make it an international center of ceramic art and invite people from all over Europe to come here. We can offer them cheap housing or maybe even free housing, various kinds of uh, tax breaks and so on. And she did this extraordinary success. People actually did, did come from all over Europe. And now there are about 25 ateliers in the village, most of them doing ceramics, a few of them doing uh, art, collage, other kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> and they have regular festivals where people come in to buy pottery. So suddenly an industry, as it were, was created out of nothing. Um, and of course it makes the village very interesting. It's full of people from all over Europe, and well, there are a few Americans, but not many, mostly they're uh, German, Dutch, Scandinavian, Italian, and uh, it gives it a sort of life, without turning it into a tourist center, it gives it a kind of liveliness, which is very, very pleasant. So there are these potteries scattered around. This is one of the biggest one of the pottery, Danushka, which is uh, owned by a Russian woman, and uh, a more modest little corner pottery by one of our neighbors. There's even a Café des Poitiers <laughs> and, uh, tucked away there. And uh, there's pottery everywhere. People even use it to decorate their windows like that. And uh, in the basement of our house, which is actually on ground level, uh, the carve as they call it, um, we decided that there was so much art around we should probably add to it. Um, and uh, go over the top a little bit. So we installed some lights in there and made it, had it cleaned up, had the mice ejected, 
well, not exactly ejected, but more, you know, calmed down a bit. And, uh, uh, as I say, put the lights up and made it into a sort of gallery on, on the street level. So each uh, uh, year we would have a, an artist come in and take over the gallery and just exhibit their, their works there, which was really very nice. Well, nice to have a potter in the basement. That's last year, I think. Yes. Hmm. And that's the village. Um, and I'll just <coughs> show you. I'll just show you a little. I can take you on a little tour, as it were. I'll give you a few picture postcard pictures. They're not really of picture postcard quality. These are just snapshots that I took um, with my very ancient camera. Um, one nice thing about the village, much of it is grey stone, um, and people are always adding little splashes of colour. It's full colour, like that. This is one of the main streets, that's all of uh, 12 feet wide, I think. Uh, the street was about 8 feet wide. Little corners like that. A lot of the uh, stone in the village has interesting origins. It comes from the old chateau at the top of the hill, and the, the village does stand on a fairly steep hill. Uh, there was a, a chateau, quite a substantial building, you can see the remains of it, which came down or fell down or was pulled down uh, sometime in the 1500s. And clearly what happened was that everybody in the village went off uh, to steal stone from the shadow, you know, so so many, including part of our basement, is, is built obviously of huge dressed mm -hmm. stones which, which were not put there for a village house, they were, they were stolen from somewhere else. And you can see little things like on the left here, uh, on the wall, there's a little gargoyle, which obviously came from the shadow, mm -hmm. um, and so on, you know, it's uh, it kind of got that charm of variety. It's a place that a uh, bookbinder, which I believe there's a bookbinder there is. Uh, and uh, this is the house belonging to some friends. Streets like that. Cars are there, as you see. Cars are a presence, but a very minor presence because there aren't many streets that can comfortably take a car. And there, again, as in the village we lived in before, there's absolutely nowhere to park. So after trying and failing to get a car into our ground floor uh, car there, we just parked some distance away and put it down to the benefits of exercise. <laughs> More colour. And rooftops. You know, I have a, a liking, as a lot of photographers do, for rooftops because they just show the, the randomness of the way a village grew up, you know, all the old bits and pieces long before, long before planning, long before you had to get planning permission for anything, people would just put up another house, put up another barn, put up another church. And this gives a lovely, highly varied landscape, roofscape. It's a rooftop cat. <laughs> there are many, many cats in this village. Uh, I happen to love cats, so that was fine by me. And uh, there are t t basically two tribes, the domestic and the wild. Uh, this is one of the wild cats. And the wild cats live very much on the rooftops, especially in the summer, because the rooftops form an almost continuous territory. They can just go from one to the other, and jump from one to the other. And this was one that, that uh, became a sort of friend who peered outside our upstairs window. Uh, we called her the Gumby Cat because she would sit there for hours and hours. Another cat. I photographed hundreds of cats, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> if you look back at the uh, picture postcards of the past, you can see that the village hardly changed, certainly from the time of early photography in the 1890s. A couple of comparisons here. The mayor's office, mm -hmm. Plus La Mary, 1890s and today, virtually unchanged. The main clock tower, uh, which, again, 1890s and today, essentially the same. They have renovated it now, so it's in splendid condition. Uh, 
the street that we're living in, Grand Rue, uh, now tidied up and cleaned up a bit, but essentially the, the building structures are the same. Uh, we don't, of course, have any of these uh, disgusting looking inhabitants standing around. We're all nice and clean and proper. And the Place du Monument, uh, War Memorial, 1890s and today, and so on. Uh, I think this is a good place for me to stop before we talk about cars. <laughs> if we're going to talk about cars at all, maybe we shouldn't talk about cars. Let's stop see if we've got any questions. On anglais, if you please. Okay. I don't really have a question, but I read your book. Mm -hmm. I'm French. I spent the winter, I'm American now. I spent the winter in the south of France, and that book is absolutely the best. Mm -hmm. If you want to spend a good time, it's <coughs> full of humor, and it's all true. <laughs> That's the way you have to think of the French. That's the way we live. Not the Eiffel Tower or you know the big castle, but this is so true. You pick it up right there. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you. Get the book. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't pay her anything. I appreciate it. I appreciate that. The question at the back there. Too. Yes, um, do you have the butcher and the bakery in town and everything, or where do you have to go for your shopping? Um, there are some copies. I bought a few copies of the book that's over there at the end of the long table. And uh, otherwise, I'm not sure if it's in the library. I didn't have time to check. Um, I can certainly make sure it is in the library, right? I can. Yeah, yeah, we'll make yeah. sure it's in the library. Yes, yeah. right. yes. Otherwise, Amazon.com. <laughs> yes, sir. I think she was asking, where do you shop for groceries and for the bread and any little restaurant in the area? Yes, um, shopping, uh, you know, that's, that's an important distinction between villages. Some of them have, have shops and some don't. And, uh, you know, the, the, the way the French describe it, they say there are open villages and closed villages. Closed villages are those that have very little in the way of amenities. They're you know, closed in on themselves, often agricultural villages. You don't want to find yourself in one of those. Open villages um, have a lot of amenities, if you're lucky. This one was terrific because it had a, a market. Let's see if I've got a picture of the market here. Not that the market's particularly a thing of beauty. <laughs> oh, here we are. Um, the market on every Friday and also every Tuesday, um, which was a, a, a terrific market. It was one of the best I've seen um, outside of Provence, frankly. Um, and the Friday market was just everything. And the Tuesday market was what they call the petit producteur, which is the, the small producers, the local producers. So you would get the, you know, the eggs from the local farms and the, the vegetables from uh, the fields, actually. They, they scarcely even bothered to dust the dirt off them. Um, they didn't come in ready washed packages. Uh, and uh, a marvelous fishmonger store, which came on both days. So, so there was that. Uh, and then there was uh, a little supermarket which had all the, the small bits and pieces you know, that you need as well as uh, you know, things that sell in the market, paper goods and so on. And, uh, and then there were one or two odd shops around and there were three restaurants. Um, good, well let's say very good, good and bad, <laughs> more or less. Um, so we, we were very well off. And there was no danger of starvation, and, and, and a, a car for a, a vineyard outlet. Yes. Do you still own this house? Are you, do you still own your home? We're just in the process of selling it. I'm hoping see. to get another one. Yeah, I see. Uh, <laughs> in the same place? Yes, in the same village, yes. Uh, so, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the winery in the region? Not with any uh, expertise, unfortunately. Um, the the, the Langebach wines are not the, not the pick of the, the bunch, as it were. It, it's uh, 
some people would say unkindly, it's industrial wine making. Uh, a lot of a lot of red wines, um, not so many whites. A lot of rosé in some areas. Uh, it's pretty good, but you know I'm not a connoisseur, and uh, I wish I was. I've been working on it for you know, 60 years, but you know, I, I just I don't have that delicacy of of taste to know the difference. So I just buy wine from. Um, the local carve, you know, whatever they recommend. Yeah. So. May I ask why you are selling one after the other? Oh, um, most. Unless it's too intimate, then you can. No, no, not at all. Nothing, nothing uh, intimate about it. It'd be more interesting if there was. Um, <laughs> no, it's just uh, the stairs, basically. It has three flights of very steep stairs. And uh, I'm getting old from my knees are going, so it's just, it's a bit of a stretch to get, get up with that. Uh, plus it's very, very small, and uh, we thought we'd get a little bit more space. How was the process being accepted by the local French? Because it's not our, our presence there? Yeah. Oh, just fine. No, no problem at all. People were very too friendly, in fact. Um, <laughs> And that, that first thing that happened was that uh, we, we sort of opened the door and uh, one of our neighbors from across the street, Raymond, an old agricultural worker, used to work in the rice fields that they had there, um, just came, walked right in. <laughs> and so they just came right in, he wanted to have a look around, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was a bit like that. The, you know, the, 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 the potters, uh, the artists were very welcoming. Um, the older people were a little more difficult. Uh, what my wife did is something I would never dare to do, or be able to do. She joined the local embroidery group. Uh, it was all these old ladies who would uh, meet every week and they would sit and embroider. And uh, uh, because she had good enough French, she joined us. Now she thought this was weird, you know, an American, she's American, do, 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 joining me embroidery group, but after a bit, you know, they began to speak to us in the street <clears throat> and shake hands. <laughs> so, back there. Is it safe? I mean, could you leave your house? Did you have to worry that somebody may break in if you're not in your home? Um, it seems to be very safe. I mean, they, they, it depends, in France, it depends very much where you are. They have a very high level of, of, of burglary. It's one of their big crimes. And uh, in a place like a village, you're much safer simply because of the people are all around. They're always in the street. They're always looking at the street. Um, anybody strange trying to, you know, get in uh, would probably have run into a problem. The village police is non-existent. Basically, there is there is supposedly a, a local policeman, but we never saw him. Um, we had the place for 10 years, we still never saw him. Um, but you can, if when you go away, leave the house, you can um, subscribe to a kind of security system, which is supposedly the police come and check on the house at regular intervals. I have no idea whether this was real or not, or just a public relations exercise. But basically, pretty safe, I would say, in terms of personal security. Yeah, it's not at all like Miss Marple, you know. Uh, yeah. So, gentlemen, the back there? Yeah. Yes, uh, you said that uh, there were very few stores in, in, this, in this village, of, but I'm sure that La Boulangerie is there. Oh, the Boulangerie, definitely. Yes. Yes. Uh, two of them, I no, three of them. Yes, it is. In fact, yes. <laughs> yeah, there, uh, uh, there is no danger of starvation in this place. You know, it was wonderfully well supplied with food. Um, and, it, you know, one thing I should mention is, is a year round, but it's sometimes these places just have become alive in summer and then drop dead in winter, so they're very dreary. Um, but because there's a school there, um, obviously, there are parents there and there are children there year-round. This, this makes a huge difference. It sounds like a small thing, but it makes a huge difference to, to the life of a place. I'm interested in the shifting of the age population in this particular village. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you can tell about the other. We have many foreigners in that particular village, but 
people? The young people do live, yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, the, the, age, the age curve of that sort of village is pretty high. It was higher when I got there too. Um, but uh, there are children around, as I say, uh, and there are teenagers around. Um, but of course, as soon as they, they need to go to college, they need to go, at best they go to Nîmes, which is easy distance, but most of them prefer to go further away because that's what students want to do, right? Where are your parents? Where's the furthest university you can think of? <laughs> um, and they go there. Uh, and uh, so they do tend to leave, and um, the only, you know, the, the, the possibilities of a place like that are mainly to keep up the, the you know, the art uh, and the pottery and all the rest of it. Other villages, not so lucky. You know, if they have nothing like that, then they do tend to slowly decline. Yes. I'd like to know if they have any houses of worship in the village, and if so, what religion, you know, houses that they have? Well, there are two. Um, the the Languedoc is a scene of the most terrible religious wars um, in the 16th century, particularly, um, and uh, Catholic versus Protestant religious wars. Nobody's ever forgotten that. Um, so, religion is not everybody's favorite thing. Um, there are two churches. There's a Catholic church at the top of the hill, which is still functioning. Small congregation, as far as I can make out. Um, and there's a Protestant church which was on the same street where we were, which is defunct. It doesn't, it doesn't operate at all. Um, although it was very useful to me because um, of the mice. Uh, when I uh, had to, uh, we had a little bit of a mouse problem, although I, I like mice, I don't mind mice. But um, my wife didn't care for them, so we live trapped them. Uh, and then there was a problem, we got you know, mice in a trap, you don't know what to do with them. So I took them to the Protestant church. <laughs> um, and, uh, because it had a nice, a nice little gap under the front door. And I thought it might be good for them. Um, I'm sure they just turned around and came straight back. But, uh, so no, they had a very, a very little over sign of religion. You know, literally millions of people were killed in these religious wars. It was a terrible time. Yeah. So you had last year. You had a, uh, a Muslim uh, uprising, not uprising, wrongly, but a, a terrible uh, uh, ex uh, murder in, in Caucasus. Mm -hmm. And uh, I realize that Caucasus is, is much further west, but do you have much in the way of problem areas between Muslims and Christians uh, and uh, whatever? Not in this village. Uh, this village is uh, mixed, but not ethnically mixed, if you, if you know what I mean. Um, there, there are some Muslims there. A couple of Muslim families just you know, a few doors away in our street, but totally integrated, you know, uh, no problem with them at all. As far as the other uh, others go, what's, what's happened is the immigration from especially from Algeria, and to some extent from Morocco, the old French colonists in North Africa. Uh, that's been going on for forever. And uh, slowly, slowly, um, they've taken over certain French, small French towns. So there are, there are towns you can go to in the south where you might as well be in, you know, in Algeria. They've got the same feel to them. Um, but I don't think there's been any particular problem about that. It's just that people have separated themselves out. The French, the French, French don't really like it very much. <laughs> but of course, the Algerian Muslims think they are French, French. So it's the same old problem. You know, how you define people. But that was that. Those problems that they had before, Carcassonne, Toulouse, and so on. Those are kind of rare, fortunately. Can you, can you envision yourself living full-time in France once you buy a new place? I can. We've, we've talked about it. Um, we've thought about retiring there. There are all sorts of problems, including the French bureaucracy, um, uh, and now including Brexit. Uh, have a European passport as well as an American passport. The European passport is going to become useless very shortly. Um, plus there's tax problems, plus there's medical care problems. You know, there, there, are, there are quite a few problems about that. So in the end, we decided we would 
stick to beer if we're going to England. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. I was told I should stop at two, so we have one to two more questions. Mm -hmm. yes. When you did envision they living there year round, mm -hmm. what about the healthcare system? That must have been a consideration in your. Yeah, um, it was definitely. Um, when you get to a certain age, you begin to think about these things are not too hard. But uh, it was very hard to get into. Um, if you wanted a small thing, uh, you know, a, a dental problem or something of that kind, or a minor medical problem or a prescription, uh, you could usually go to one of the local doctors and they would just do what you wanted and just not charge you because they had no system for charging you. <laughs> they can't, you know, they've got no way of taking money. Um, so that's fine, but if it's something more serious and you have to go to hospital, then uh, then you then you have a problem because you need the what's called the cartridge towel, which uh, yeah, that, which is very important, very which is very difficult important. to get for a foreigner. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Which is difficult <coughs> to get for a foreigner. It takes it takes about four four years at least of residence I think, before you can yeah. get one. So if you if you don't fall ill in those four years. You're fine. Um, very often, you know, you can get quick medical attention. Uh, I managed to fall down a flight of stone steps once and uh, knock myself out. And nobody thought of calling the doctor. They said, take him to the pharmacist. So he took me to the pharmacist. I was dri dripping blood. And uh, the pharmacist patched, patched me up, gave me some pills, didn't charge anything. You can't guarantee that, of course. <laughs> Yes. What, what months are you staying? Or do you usually stay in France? Which months of the year? Um, we've stayed there all year from time to time, but, but uh, recently we've stayed mostly May, June, July, or June, July, August, September, that kind of you know, summertime, basically. Uh, the winters are not particularly appealing, frankly. You can talk about the south of France, you imagine being like this, you know, beautiful sunshine. No, it's not, you know, it rains a lot, there's a lot of wind, and on occasion, snow. You're talking about Provence, but the south of France, on the Mediterranean, the weather is perfect for the winter. Sometimes. Very little rain. It, it, can, it can be nasty. Yeah, it, in a bar, or mm -hmm. in a bouche du Rhône, yeah. near Marseille, but Nice can and that is pretty good. That's better, yes. Yeah, that's yeah, better. That means, come on. <laughs> <laughs> the center, the center of London, you get it. so much wind. Exactly. Wind, 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 wind. Yeah. Yeah. Really fierce wind. Yeah. How about real estate taxes if you want a house there and you're an American? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch. How about real estate taxes? You pay taxes on your house, or how does it work? You do, you do pay taxes on your house. It's a, a tiny fraction of what we pay in a house here. Oh, yes. Um, and uh, the taxes on the sale of a house also are very much less than they are here. Uh, so the whole business of buying and selling is, is not quite so traumatic as it is on Long Island. Where, uh, but um, you, know, you, do get, you do get taxed on pretty much everything. They even tax you on your television which is really wicked because the television in France is so bad, you know, it's just <laughs> not worth being taxed on. <laughs> okay, anything else? Oh, we have to get some time. Well, it's okay. It's fine. Okay. Fine. Well, thank you so much well, thank for coming, you. everybody. Thank you.